afternoon, gentlemen. And at the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Bansi and RSSDI for having given me this wonderful opportunity to present before you, and of course, to my respected chairpersons for their kind introduction. So I'm going to talk about the role of corneal confocal microscopy in diabetic neuropathy. It's a relatively new area of research, which probably we as clinicians need to know as time progresses. So I have divided my talk into two bits. The first bit is a very short introduction about diabetic neuropathy per se, and what corneal confocal microscopy can do to contribute in the understanding of diabetic neuropathy. And finally, I would present some of our data that's currently under revision in American Diabetes Association's prestigious journal, Diabetes. So when we talk about diabetic neuropathy, it's the presence of symptoms and or signs of peripheral nerve dysfunction in individuals with diabetes after you've got excluded other causes of neuropathy. So it's similar to the nephropathy kind of definition where you've excluded other causes and where you think the cause is diabetes per se. Now, when you're talking about neuropathy, of course, you're worried about the symptoms. Autonomic dysfunction is something which is terrible. Only last week, one of the ministers of West Bengal, you might have seen, died suddenly after being in the hospital and having angioplasty and all of it. He was ready to go home. I had spoken to him about an hour and a half ago. Sudden death with an arrhythmia. And, of course, Diabetes is the commonest cause of non-traumatic amputation world over, and maybe in India we are probably doing even worse. And of course, poor quality of life. If you, if you actually speak to your patients, the ones who are unable to sleep at night, they do have very poor quality of life. I'm not going to bore you about the kinds or the types of diabetic neuropathy, but I would predominantly concentrate on the first variety, that is diffuse symmetrical sensory motor neuropathy, or predominantly sensory neuropathy that happens in diabetes, because that's what we are most importantly concerned, and of course, about autonomic neuropathy. So when we are talking about diabetic neuropathy, we've got to diagnose early, because half of our patients, or if not more than half of our patients, are not even aware that they have neuropathy. You know, something has happened, maybe they've twisted an ankle and then gone and put their foot in warm water and then developed a blister and then come back to you with problems. The other issue, like I said, is we need to exclude other causes of neuropathy. The other thing that we often don't talk about is the size of the nerve fiber and what senses they carry. So classically, we are taught that there is large fibers in the body and small fibers of nerves, as we talk about. And if you look at, the large fibers carry predominantly the muscle, the motor part of the bit, and then touch and vibration. They are all myelinated nerves, the larger ones. And as you move to the right of this cartoon, you see the size of the nerve becomes smaller and smaller. And it's the small nerves which carry sensations of cold perception, pain, and the autonomic symptoms are because of abnormalities of small neurons. We've tried to summarize what the symptoms of large fiber neuropathy and small fiber neuropathy are in this slide. But one of the predominant reasons why I've actually put this up is because we are going to talk about cornea, right? So if the cornea had myelinated nerves, you would not be able to see because it, the cornea would have then become opaque. So the cornea essentially has unmyelinated nerve, which is small nerves in the cornea. And if you look at the natural history of neuropathy, and if you look at subclinical to clinical neuropathy, it is suggestive that the first problem happens in the small nerves and not the large nerves. So if you're talking about early detection, you've got to pick up problems of the small nerves in diabetic neuropathy. And in clinic, what do we do? We do a monofilament test. We kind of look at posterior sensation, maybe position sense and joint sense. We go for an ankle jerk. If that is normal, we tell the patient, okay, you don't have clinically very significant neuropathy, you then go for something like a VPT, which will be more sensitive than that. If you want to do something even more sensitive, what do you do? You ask for a nerve conduction test, right? The challenge and the problem is the nerve conduction test does not detect small fiber disease. 
it only detects large fiber neuropathy. So that is why you will see patients who have normal otherwise clinical tests complaining to you about paresthesia, complaining to you about positive sensory symptoms of neuropathy because it is the small fibers which have gone, the patient's large fiber tests are all normal. So we've got to understand that if you are trying to pick up things early, it's the small fibers that is important. And this is why I have said there can be clinico-electrophysiological dissociation. That means electrophysiological study versus clinical findings are different. And often people will have problems what we now call subclinical neuropathy. Like I said, NCS does not assess small fibers. So how can you assess small fiber neuropathy? The first, which was thought to be the gold standard, is intraepidermal nerve density. So you do a skin biopsy and you look at the nerve density. Now, is that possible in clinical practice? No, because of two reasons. Obviously, it's invasive. And secondly, diabetes is a lifelong disease. So for example, if it is normal today, are you going to repeat it again after a few months or a year? For example, urine albumin creatinine ratio, you can do it 10 times. Aaj kal parsu do sal baad. So therefore, it's not very easily feasible. The second could be doing autonomic function tests. Now, we all know about autonomic function tests, but how many of us are actually being able to do it in clinical practice? It's not very practical test in routine clinical practice. The next could be looking at thermal detection threshold. That some of us are doing, particularly in the bigger institutes in the research setup, so definitely looking at warm temperature and cold perception and warm perception tests. And the rest, the bottom line is what we are going to talk about, is corneal confocal microscopy. So the cornea has the densest innervation from the trigeminal neurons, and they become smaller and smaller as they reach the corneal apex. And in the subbasal corneal plexus, you have a network of these unmyelinated C fibers that we can see with a corneal confocal microscopy. Now these nerves, because it's just like the retina, where you're looking at fundoscopy, you can actually see what is happening in the blood vessel. Here you can actually see what is happening in the nerve layer. And obviously, just like when you're doing fundoscopy, is only diabetes the cause of abnormal fundal findings? Other systemic illnesses might also cause problems. Similarly, other neurological problems other than diabetes also might lead to problems in the corneal nerve layer. So if you look at the utility of corneal confocal microscopy, I've put up three of our own patients' photographs. On this, on the left-hand panel is what it normally looks like. And there are three parameters that we are supposed to look, like, look at. For example, when we are talking about fundoscopy, what do we say? We look at octet disc, you look at macula, you look at the vessel, you look at hard exudate, soft exudate, like that. So here, you're supposed to look at nerve fiber length, nerve branch density, you can see. So as you go to the other side, you will see that the nerve fiber lengths go down, nerve fiber density go down, and the nerve branch density goes down. These are the three parameters that we are supposed to look at when we are looking at the corneal nerves. So this is the machine that we've managed to procure in our own institute as well. This is a corneal confocal microscope. Looks similar to like say a slit lamp microscope or the otherwise. But the only difference is you can see there's a laser camera there. And you can see we are putting a gel on the camera and on top of that you're putting a tomo cap which is disposable, the plastic thing in the second panel bottom. And you are putting an anesthetic drop in the eye of the patient so that that contact comes in contact with. So this is how the patient leans forward with the chin. And you will see you are adjusting the length, focal length of the camera so that you get a good image on the screen there. And you will see there is, if I go back, there was another camera at the side. You can see there's a side viewing camera. With that side viewing camera, you are trying to see whether the laser is actually pointing on the central point of the cornea because that is where you want to image. And this was developed at the University of Manchester in Dr. Andrew Bolton's lab by Professor Raiz Malik and his team. And they came up with these three parameters that I've told you, corneal nerve length, nerve fiber density, and the nerve branch density. So you have to take three sets of images from each eye. And this is what the image looks like. 
and you can either manually analyze the data or use automated software for analysis of data. I have shown you the manual evaluation that we've done so that you know exactly what we're trying to do. See, for example, each of those NAR fibers we have highlighted with a stylet on the screen to show that is where the nerve is going and the green dots are where the nerve either ends or there is a branch of the nerve. So with that, there is, so this is, this can be done manually or in an automated manner and very complicated numbers will come here. Forget about the numbers. But in principle, you've understood that when you have nerve involvement, the fiber length will go down, the branch densities will go down, and the fiber density will also go down. So the first of the studies was published in 2003 when Raya's Malik and his team showed that in 18 individuals with diabetes compared to non-diabetic individual, that these parameters were abnormal. And that has been replicated by several people thereafter. Thereafter, people started telling us, you know, what is the normative value? So what is normal and what is abnormal? So this was again Raya's Malik's team coming up with certain figures that you do not need to remember will be the normal values. Now what they did was in one of the type 1 diabetes studies, they said, okay, we have clinically examined this guy. He's got no neuropathy of small fiber but he's got abnormal changes on the corneal confocal microscopy. And there's a second group who have normal corneal confocal microscopy. So the ones who have some abnormality on the corneal confocal microscopy, they went on to progress and develop clinical neuropathy. So that longitudinally told us that there's a problem here, which is getting picked up by this particular test. It is like your ACR telling you, you know, this guy with macroalbuminuria is going to progress to diabetic kidney disease. Thereafter, there was one study to look at, you know, all this while we looked at skin biopsy and said that was gold standard. So why don't we actually look at people, compare the skin biopsy finding with the confocal microscopy finding, and they showed that the results were identical. And they also so showed that, you know, whatever small fibers you, abnormality you're picking up on the cornea, that corroborated with their autonomic dysfunction as well. And like I said, this probably precedes clinical neuropathy. The other issue is then, then what would be the clinical implication or the use of this? For example, if I tell you I have a drug which will prevent diabetic kidney disease, you will first tell me, okay, first show that there is regression of albuminuria, then show that there is slowing of the EGFR. So it's not that any drug in development will have development of the extreme end, say for example, prevention of death. You will need a much bigger trial, longer time. So if you are doing, say for example, a trial on a drug which will modify neuropathy, this will be the best test. It's like a bone marker test to say that bone density is improving rather than DEXA telling you that the bone density is improving. DEXA will come later on. So this is a study where they have gone for people who received kidney pancreas transplantation. And after the kidney pancreas transplantation, as compared to before the transplantation, they could show that there is improvement in the corneal nerve layer. So that shows that a bit of the neuropathy is reversible, and those improvements happen much earlier than clinical improvement of neuropathy. Of course, there are pitfalls. For example, do we have data of what happens as we age? because there might be age-related changes to the nerve. Do we have ethnicity-specific data? Do we have gender-specific data, racial data? And we are still a long way to go before we can jump in and say, you know, start using this in your clinic from tomorrow, because this costs 42 lakhs. Obviously, as instruments go, it's just like the insulin pump. When it first came, you probably had a, it was, it was more like a machine rather than a pump. So I'm going to present some of our own data from our institute. We realized that if we are looking at children with type 1 diabetes, because you know why, why we chose type 1 diabetes? Because you know the time of onset of the disease, unlike type 2 diabetes where they might have had the disease for a long period of time. We wanted to see how do they develop nerve damage. And we realized that obviously we could not do biopsies and autonomic functions are not routinely performed. So we went for thermal detection threshold, and of course we did everything else. 
So first of all, what we did was, if you see the group on the left in blue, is the siblings of type 1 diabetes. Because we didn't have any normative data for our country. So the siblings of type 1 diabetes, we, they underwent all neurological tests, including temperature, warm perception threshold, cold perception threshold, NCVs, VPTs, all of it. And on the basis of the qu quantitative sensory testing that we did, we came up with normative values for warm detection threshold and cold detection threshold. And we, uh, they underwent corneal confocal microscopy, and we defined what would be the normative cutoffs for each of these three parameters of corneal confocal microscopy. So we then went on to our cohort of type 1 diabetes, and they underwent corneal confocal microscopy. And we found that if you had a normal corneal confocal microscopy, all of the tests were almost normal, almost all of them except one patient. So it told us if CCM is normal, there is no need to do any other tests of neuropathy. But if CCM was abnormal, you can see almost 50% of them were abnormal without any abnormalities on small fiber testing, telling us that these abnormalities precede any other possible ways of testing neuropathy in our population. So very, very strong statement that this would be the most sensitive of tests to do to detect small fiber neuropathy. So as you can see, this is a healthy volunteer, one of the siblings, panel 1 and 1A. The second is a nine-year-old girl who has relatively reasonably preserved corneal nerves, but as you move to patient 3 and patient 4, which is same patient with, in the two eyes, you can see glycemic control poor, duration of diabetes long, has significant corneal confocal nerve abnormalities. So we've been able to establish what is the temperature detection thresholds in children and adolescents in India, what the normative parameters of CCM for our ethnic population is, and we found that small fiber dysfunction precedes large fiber dysfunction because none of these children had any large fiber abnormalities on nerve conduction velocity studies. And we found that 50% of children with type 1 diabetes have some kind of small fiber dysfunction. And of them, 50% didn't have any clinically detectable neuropathy test abnormalities. And normal CCM almost excludes small fiber disease. And CCM abnormalities detect small fiber abnormalities even before small fiber dysfunction can be detected by the currently used clinical tests. I shall stop there.